It's all about Tony Spilotro. Tony Spilotro parents ran a restaurant in Chicago that became a hangout for local mobsters. Spilotro became a made man in 1963 and would be sent in Las Vegas by the early 1970s. Later he was forming his own faction, the Hole in the Wall Gang. His continued involvement in criminal activity led to Spilotro being backlisted from casinos making it difficult to enforce his position. Having angered his bosses and other associates with his actions in Las Vegas, Spilotro and his brother were brutally beaten and murdered by mob associates on June 23 in 1986. The early life of Anthony Dion Spilotro, born on May 19, 1938, in a tough neighborhood in Chicago, Illinois, Tony Spilotro was one of six children, all boys, Vincent, Victor, Patrick, Johnny and Michael. His parents Pasquale and Antoniette Spilotro were Italian immigrants who ran an eatery named Patsy's restaurant. It was through his family's business that young Anthony first became acquainted with organized crime. Patsy's was a regular mobster hangout and meetings between made men were frequently held in the restaurant's parking lot. Spilotro and his brothers often engaged in criminal activities together, including shoplifting and uh, purse snatching. Spilotro became a neighborhood bully with a reputation for fighting at an early age. In 1954, his father died suddenly, leaving his mother to raise their six sons. That same year, he dropped out of Steinmetz High School when he was sub home and spent most of his time engaging in petty crime. At the age of 16, he earned his first arrest for attempting to steal a shirt. He was fined and placed on probation. The arrest did nothing to curb Spilotro's ever increasing criminal activities. And by his early 20s, he had been arrested multiple times. But small time activity was no longer enough for Spilotro, and he soon had his eye on Chicago's biggest crime family. He also had eyes for Nancy Stewart, a petite local waitress who worked in a local mob hangout and married her in 1960. The Chicago Underworld. By 1962, Spilotro had befriended several influential members of the Chicago Underworld, including Vincent the Saint, the Saint in Zero, Joseph, Joey the Clown, Lombardo, and mob boss Joey Dove's Ayupa. Spilotro joined Sam Mad Sam De Stefano's crew that same year. De Stefano was considered too unpredictable and undisciplined to ever be considered for real leadership, but his violent and sadistic nature was highly sought after by his bosses as a way to spread fear and terror. Even law enforcement was leery of him. The m, &M murders. Through De Stefano's guidance, Spilotro family earned a contract to murder Bill McCarthy and Jimmy Miralia, two 24-year-old burglars known as the m, m brothers or m, m boys. The victims had killed two thieves in Elmwood Park, a neighborhood 
where many crime bosses live and thus considered off limits by the Chicago mob who were known as the outfit wanting to send a message about this violation of their space Spilot retorted the man before killing them in an infamous interrogation technique to get McCarthy to reveal the whereabouts of Miralia Spilotro had his thugs stuck McCarthy's head in a vice until the victim's eye popped out their maggot covered corpses with throat slit were found by authorities in the trunk of a car on Chicago's south side later that year and the case was dubbed the m, &M murders. The vicious killing won below through a reputation with area mobsters and earned him the status of maid in 1963. His new title also scored him a job controlling bookmaking territory on the northwest of Chicago. But Spilotro's standing also caught the attention of local law enforcement as well as the media, who began referring to Spilotro as the aunt. In reference to his small stature, and both he had De Stefano were considered suspects in the Eminem murders and other murders that began to pile up. Marked man murder of Leo Foreman. Spilotro became a marked man and federal law enforcement worked hard to put him behind bars. In November 1963, the FBI managed to turn Charles Chucky Grimaldi, a former member of De Stefano's crew, into a federal witness. Grimaldi testified against Spilotro and De Stefano during the murder trial of Leo Foreman, a loan collector who had made the mistake of throwing De Stefano out of his office in May of that year. Foreman was lured to the home of De Stefano's brother Mario, ostensibly to play cards and see a newly constructed bomb shelter. Once there, Spilotto and Grimaldi dragged their victim into the cellar where Sam De Stefano beat Foreman with a hammer, then repeatedly stabbed him with an ice pick. He was then shot in the head and left in the trunk of an abandoned car. Despite overwhelming evidence, both Spilotro and De Stefano were acquitted. In 1967, in a crackdown on illegal gambling, the IRS agents raided Spilotro's home and learned he'd been running a gambling operation out of his house. He was fined but served no time. In 1969, the police department wise suspected Spilotro was running a bookmarking racket in an abandoned basement and set out to, to raid it. Spilotro and his associates stalled the police at the door while they ate the paper beds in an attempt to destroy the evidence. But he was busted when more evidence was found in his office. Once more he was fined but didn't serve any time. But with the heat on, Spilotro decided it was time to leave town. But Spilotro's rush with the law didn't keep him from conducting business as usual. Throughout the 1960s, a series of murders occurred in which the mobster was believed to have participated, but no charges were ever officially made. Vegas Underworld Spilotro continued to gain fame throughout the syndicate as both as an earner and informer. By 1971, Spilotro was tapped by Ayupa to replace Marshall Caifano as the mob's representative in Las Vegas, Nevada. In his new role, Spilotro worked on the Chicago boss's scheme to embezzle profits from area casinos. Using a frontman as the casino owner, the mob then placed a new mobster in the casino court rooms, Frank Lefty Rosenthal. A mobster who could never be a made man according to mob rules because he was 
of Swedish descent. He was adopted by a Jewish family, not of full Southern Italian descent. Rosenthal's job was to access the rooms and remove as much cash as possible called the scam. Before it was recorded as revenue, he excelled at this work. The money was then sent back to Chicago Outfit and several other Mafia families. To protect the skim assets, Spilotro was hired to keep a watchful eye on Rosenthal and the other members of the outfit. Once in Las Vegas, Spilotro, under the alias Tony Stewart, took over the circus hotel gift shop as well as control of the Vegas underworld. The gold rush. Spilotro's first move was to require a criminal to pay a street tax to continue doing business. If they didn't pay, they were threatened with that. Indeed, homicides in Las Vegas increased after Spilotro's arrival. Spilotro's next move came in 1976 when he opened his jewelry and electronics store. The gold rush in partnership with his brother Michael and one of his lieutenants, Chicago bookmaker Herbert Fat Herbie Blitzstein. The gold rush sold both stolen and legitimate goods. Spilotro had to be careful when it came to what was sold in the store. He avoided selling items that were stolen in Las Vegas, lest the rightful owner came into the store and saw him. He also correctly suspected that the FBI had bugged the store and so he needed to be careful when speaking on the phone. The Hole in the Wall Gang The gold rush located on block of the Vegas Strip became home to Spilotro's team of burglars who would break into hotel rooms, wealthy homes and high-end stores and steal their goods. The group then fenced the items they stole. The crew was successful and used whatever means necessary to get the goods they wanted. If they couldn't find an easy way into their target building or stores, they drilled a hole in the wall or the roof. Because of this, they gave themselves the nickname the Hole in the Wall Gang. In 1979, the FBI arrested one of Spilotto's associates, Sherwin Jerry Listener, for larceny. Listener wanted to cut a deal and word got back to Spilotro that Listener planned to testify before a federal grand jury. Spilotro hatched a plan to eliminate Listener and plotted with mock enforcer Frank Colotta to kill him, which Colotta did. Believing the action had been given the green light from the bosses back in Chicago. By December of that year, the police turned up the heat and the Nevada Gambling Commission officially back listen Spilotro. The ruling legally barred Spilotro from entering any of the state's casinos, the very ones it was his job to observe. By the end of 1970, Spilotro had become a loose cannon running a loan sharking operation out of a casino, fencing stolen jewelry and ordering the murder of listener, which was not authorized by the outfit. He had also become entangled with Rosenthal's wife, Gary, and the two were having a less than secret affair, an egregious offense in mob culture that could result in a hit against the offender. News of his affair with Rosenthal's wife made it back to the bosses in Chicago. None of this prevented Spilotro from continuing to conduct his business, however. The Hole in the Wall Gang now included Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Officer Joe Blasco and mob members Frank Culotta, Leo Guardino, Ernest Davino, Cel Romano, Lawrence Newman, Wayne Matecki, Samuel Cusumano and Joseph Cusumano. The mob, however, wasn't pleased 
with the amount of attention that Spilotio was drawing to himself. The casino blacklisting and the affair with Gary Rosenthal created unwanted headaches for the outfit. In the minds of the mob bosses, Spilotro had two strikes against him. His third would come soon enough. On the 9th of July the 4th, 1981, the Hole in the Wall gang had planned a big robbery of Bertha's gifts and home furnishings, which they believed would garner at least 1 million in profits. But once they had uh, penetrated the roof, police surrounded the store and arrested Kuloda, Blasco, Guardino, Davino, Neumann and Matecki. They were each charged with burglary, conspiracy, to commune burglary, attempt grand urgency and possession of burglary tools. Spilotro was nowhere to be found, but two weeks later he was tracked down and arrested. The botched robbery was due to the defection of the alarm system specialist in the group, Sal Romano. He had turned informant after authorities had packed him for another crime and thus told the police about the planned haste. Frank Culotta also turned state's witness after he discovered covers. Spilotro had put a contract on his life. Kuloda's testimony, however, proved to be insufficient evidence when prosectors were unable to link Spilotro to the crime. It was Kuloda's word against Spilotro. Spilotro was acquitted, but he was shortly indicated again, this time with Chicago Associates for the Casino Scheming Racket. By this time, the Chicago Syndicate bosses were were not pleased in their opinions. Spilotro had made a public spectacle of himself in Las Vegas and in doing so had exposed their records and cost them millions. They decided Spilotro had to go. As later testimony indicated, the Spilotro brothers were called into a meeting in Chicago with the understanding that Michael Spilotro would become a made man. Instead, on June the 14th, 1986, in a hit involving nearly a dozen other mobsters, the brothers were beaten before being buried in a cornfield in Enos, Indiana. The location of their rotten bodies was discovered by a farmer not far from a farm formerly owned by Joseph Ayupa. When he died, Spilotro left behind his wife Nancy, whom he married in 1960. The couple had an adopted son named Vincent. If you enjoyed my video, show me how cool you are. Like, share, see you next time. Ciao ciao, ci vediamo.